Welcome to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com, dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. Serving leaders, managers, and people who will be, helping you reach excellence in your work and achieve your personal goals at the same time. Sign up for the free course at clearandopen.com. Good marketers, they're listening for what you really need that you can't even find words for, that you don't even know. They're trying to find this vague sense, this thing between the lines. They're trying to listen really deeply for what would rock your world that you can't even speak to. That's great marketing. Hi, it's Joseph, and thanks for tuning in to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com. Marketers know a lot about how human beings think and operate, some of which you may not even know about yourself. For example, most people have no idea what they really want. Or more accurately, most people have some ideas about what they want, but they don't really know. Marketers also know that humans make purchasing decisions emotionally first, then rationalize them afterwards. But for some reason, we rarely talk about how to apply that knowledge to areas outside of commerce. Today, I want to talk more about the insight that marketers have on human behavior, especially when it comes to what people really want and how we can apply that knowledge to managing ourselves and, more importantly, others. I offer weekly member webcasts, online courses, and mentorship at clearandopen.com because it's my truth that with the right tools, anyone can eliminate the people, money, and time problems holding them back in business. And I share parts of these webcasts and courses on this show because I want to help you, too. If you're enjoying the show and learning from it, I'd love your feedback. If you're listening to the show on an Apple device, all you have to do is open the podcast app, view the full description of the episode, and click the link to leave a rating and review for the show. Thanks so much for listening. Let's start the show. I want to start by talking about a talk that someone gave about someone else. Has any of you ever seen the uh, Malcolm Gladwell, I think it was a TED Talk, Malcolm Gladwell talk about a guy named Moskowitz, uh, Howard Moskowitz, about spaghetti sauce. If you search for Malcolm Gladwell, I'll put the link in the in the course online. But if you if you just Google Malcolm Gladwell spaghetti sauce or Malcolm Gladwell Moskowitz, you'll find it. It's a brilliant and fascinating talk about how some of you are old enough to remember that uh, when when we old folks and older were growing up, there were two kinds of spaghetti sauce. There was Prego and there was Ragu, and that was it. And now you go to the store and there's like 47 kinds of spaghetti sauce and the limit is only, you know, and there could be 12 brands of 47 different kinds of spaghetti sauce. The limit is only uh, how much shelf space uh, the store has. There's a really specific reason for that. And that happened because of the market research this guy Moskowitz did. And the, the fascinating story of it, I'm, I really encourage you to watch the talk because everything you need to know about marketing, and I'm going to connect it to management, is in there. The summary conclusion is people don't know what they want. People don't know what they want. The most brilliant innovations in product marketing don't happen when people, when there's market research done and the consumers say, we want a product that does the X or we want a product with a feature that does Y. That's not how it works. I mean, that surely happens and things improve that way. But the, the most significant advances happen when the marketers figure out what the people really want that they don't know that they want. You guys know when Steve Jobs conceived of the iPad? In the 80s. In the 80s. Think about that for a second. Now, I don't know if that was before or after Inspector Gadget existed because Penny had the computer book, which was basically an iPad. Right? That was when laptops were like $5,000 or something and no, no one had them. Oh my God, look, a laptop. And they were three inches thick. He conceived of that iPad in the 80s. And then, I don't know, I imagine a little bit later, the idea of, I think everyone needs their entire music collection on something that's the size of a credit card. No one was asking for that. Nobody thought they needed that. That was so out of the box. I mean, certainly some people thought of it. The more entrepreneurial of, of people maybe thought that. 
But I mean, it's inconceivable. I mean, every once in a while, I'll open up Google Play and I'll, I'll just remind myself, I've got access to 30 million songs right now. I can play whatever I want. Sometimes it's kind of overwhelming. Like I just sit there and enjoy the privilege of, you know, finding the Rocky Horror Picture Show soundtrack and five different versions of it or whatever. It's all there. This is amazing. So the story of the spaghetti sauce was that looking at the market research, they were trying to find the, the question they were oriented toward was finding the perfect spaghetti sauce. What is the perfect flavor spaghetti sauce? What is the perfect Pepsi? What is the perfect Coke? And what the data kept showing was there is no such thing as a perfect spaghetti sauce. There is no such thing as a perfect Pepsi. There are perfect Pepsis, he keeps saying, because that's what the data showed. People had different preferences. My favorite part of the talk is when Gladwell says to the audience, if I, he said, if I survey all of you and ask you what kind of coffee you like, the majority of you will tell me you like a rich, bitter, dark roast. But if we actually do taste testing and look at the real data, the, the data will show that you like weak, milky, sweet coffee. And I love that example because, it's, it, because it really depicts why we're not honest with ourselves, right? You can feel like the rich, dark, bitter roast, right? There's something strong there. There's like a self imagic sort of like, yeah, that's what strong, romantic, existential poet type people with goatees and brilliant haikus looking out the window at a rainy scene or drinking, right? They're not drinking a, a latte with three pumps of vanilla in it, you know? It's not as cool, right? We have that wherever cultural conditioning and what and whatnot. That's just in us somewhere. So because of the existence of the self-image, among other things, but especially because of the existence of the self-image, we have this idea about how we're supposed to be, which is different than who we are. So this is puzzles market researchers a whole lot. This is a problem they have to solve. So when they do focus groups and do research and whatnot. They're not just listening, good marketers, they're not listening for what you tell them they want. They're listening for what you really need that you can't even find words for, that you don't even know. They're trying to find this vague sense, this thing between the lines. They're trying to listen really deeply for what would rock your world that you can't even speak to. That's great marketing. Crappy marketing is... Well, they said the, they want the widget to have a third knob on it. Okay, let's give them that. Let's see how many other people want that. And that creates incremental improvements if it's done well. But it doesn't create iPads. It doesn't create iPhones. And it doesn't create 47 different kinds of spaghetti sauce. Now, interestingly, there's another thing going on. Since the 47 kinds of uh, spaghetti sauce now exists and soup and salad dressing, another one, right? How often do you guys stand in the grocery store looking at the 47 selections that you have and you become overwhelmed, right? The research now shows because there's sort of a bell curve thing with that. Too. So, you know, in the 50s and the, in the 60s, it was like, here's, you've got A and B, choose. And turns out we wanted more choices. Well, as often happens, there's such a thing as too much of a good thing. Now the research shows that if people have too many choices, if they have more than three to five choices for something, they end up less happy. There's actually studies that have been done about this. So that because what it leaves you with is you had 47 choices of spaghetti sauce and it's okay, you grab two and then you go home. And then while you're eating it, you're thinking, maybe that number 43 was really the one I should have gotten. It's a fear of missing out. Fear of missing out didn't exist so much 30, 40 years ago. Right? But now you can get any information. You, you know, that's the fear of missing out. Like uh, you know, when you have 30 million songs to choose from, it's not like you choose from the 12 CDs you happen to have like in your car or something. You, know, you could be listening to anything. Are you listening to the exact right perfect song right now? What is it? Have you ever obsessed about that? Or you're like, oh no, this isn't the exact right song. This is not the perfect music for the soundtrack that is my life right now. I've got to find something else. Right? Or Netflix, right? You could, you've got this menu of movies of you know, thousands and, and 20 minutes in, you're thinking, maybe I should have chosen that other one. Maybe I should have chosen that other one. That creates overwhelm and a kind of chronic dissatisfaction. This is how marketers think. Fascinating, isn't it? 
well, we've got to give the people just enough choices to make them feel like they've got choice and a lot of control, but not so many so they get overwhelmed and feel dissatisfied. Fascinating, isn't it? So the summary here is what, what marketers know about human beings that few human beings know about themselves is what? You have no idea what you want. Well, more accurate to say is you have some ideas about what you want, but you don't really know. You don't really know. You don't really know. You're operating with a model for what you want, but it's not the reality. And that is a significant cause of suffering, of course. Don't know what you want. So now, what does all this have to do with management? Well, the fascinating thing to me about marketing who you know, who poured billions of dollars into the premise that human beings make decisions emotionally, make purchasing decisions emotionally. They know this. This is just a fact. Human beings make purchasing decisions emotionally, and then they justify it mentally. But what fascinates me about this is how easy it is to translate that into, but how rarely it translates into human beings make all decisions emotionally and then justify them mentally. Why would it be different? Well, when I chose, you know, that kind of cheese over that other cheese, okay, sure, maybe that was emotional because the label was pretty. But when I chose my spouse, that was a very careful decision. (laughs) Well, surely it was more careful in that you put more time and energy into it, but it was no less emotional. Not entirely emotional, but we, the first reaction is the emotion. And then the, and we justify it mentally. This is why first impressions are so important because that first impression is emotional. And it's very hard to unseat that. Very hard to change that because it happens on an emotional level. This is why the, um, the Dunning Kruger effect exists. You know, remember, that's the, the phenomenon where people who evaluate themselves at being really good at something, it means either they are really good at something or they really are not good at it at all because they've emotionally created some idea of themselves, a self-image. They have an, on, the, on the emotional level an idea that they're good at something and despite giving them evidence that they're not, they'll hold true to that initial emotional frame. Same way people who voted for a certain candidate, you know, just as a hypothetical, for example, will hold on to their decision as being a right one despite a preponderance of evidence that it was not the right one. Of course, this happens every election. What would the world look like if people could actually take in information that didn't fit with their emotionally held beliefs? I'm going to say that again. What would the world look like if people were able to take in new information that didn't fit with their emotionally held beliefs? What would your life look like if you were able to take in information that didn't fit with your emotionally held beliefs? It was like logic could be a lot more important. (laughs) (laughs) I love the way you use understatement, Tyler. Thanks for listening to Manage to Engage, the clear and open podcast. Join us next week when you'll be a little bit closer to who you're destined to be. Until then, know that clear and open is dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. If you want to help the show grow, I'd appreciate you leaving a rating and review on iTunes. All you have to do is open the Apple Podcasts app, view the full description of the episode, and click the link to leave a rating and review. Or you can go to clearandopen.com slash review, and it will bring you to the right place. If you're looking for more support on your journey, head over to clearandopen.com for even more tools, articles, and free resources. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now.